Um, hey, appreciate the introduction, Harold, and, and uh, just a, a little bit more, more on my background. Uh, I've been a CCA since I think around 1996. Uh, 09418 is my number, so um, below the 10,000s as far as uh, uh, getting my CCA um, entrance and, and introduction. And then a few years ago, uh, became a certified professional agronomist. Uh, which is a, a kind of an extension of the CCA program. So, um, you know, appreciate the opportunity today to share with you a little pest management stuff. R reality is uh, on a daily basis, I do a lot of things in relationship to nutrient management and um, Lake Erie in particular, but some of the water quality issues in the state of Ohio. Um, so don't get to talk about uh, some of the other issues in agronomy as much as I did uh, when I was working in Fulton County for 25 years as a county educator. So um, it's been uh, good to have this annual opportunity to talk a little bit about pest management, which is an area that I, I really do enjoy working in. So that was a quickie on life cycles within insects. And we're going to talk now about identifying um, and identifying uh, the insect itself, then identifying the injury of the insect, and talk a little bit about management uh, of these uh, different organisms that we see as primary pests. Um, if you open up your um, field guide to page 27, you're going to see something that looks very similar to this. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about corn, soybean, wheat, and alfalfa, I think is the order that I have them in here. Uh, but we're going to uh, see a scouting guide. It's going to give us an ideal of, uh, of uh, when we go out into a field in May, what type of organisms we might see. So, you know, when we were talking earlier about developing a scouting plan and scouting once a month, if we're in April, May, we know we're going to look at some of those or look for some of those insects at the top of that chart. Uh, once we get into June, we're going to shift a little bit in the insects that we look for and by the end of the season, we're certainly going to be looking for a different group of insects. So if we're out there once a month, we can kind of focus in on these different groups. And based on a history of that field, we might even be more specific in what we look at because some uh, pests tend to be um, resident within a field. And so, um, you know, we find them within that uh, particular field boundary more frequently than we would the rest of our fields. And we will think about a different management system within that field due to that characteristic. Um, one of the first insects is sea corn maggot. And actually, if you turn your guide over to page 29, you'll see this um, insect in there. Uh, sea corn maggot, uh, what they are is uh, they um, are attracted to decaying organic material within a, a field. Um, you know, when we plow down, um, alfalfa or we plow down a cover crop. Um, if we, uh, in essence, have a lot of decaying material within the uh, root zone of the plant early in the season based off of some recent management, that's where we're going to be most likely to see sea corn maggot. Um, it's, an, it's a pest of uh, corn, also a pest of uh, soybeans that we can see, and, and we'll see them in both sections. But uh, uh, management here is thinking about a, a seed treatment, and it would be a situation where we're um, actually plowing down uh, some type of cover. And, and for the research that looks at effectiveness of insecticides towards sea corn maggot, that's exactly what they do, is they'll plow down a cover crop, and then they'll uh, plant the, the treatments into that uh, cover crop uh, plow down. Uh, the second insect that we uh, take a look at is corn flea beetle. And uh, you see the beetle here. This is an early season, at least as far as concern about the insect. Um, early season uh, pests that we look at. Uh, you can see the scratching uh, that it does. So it basically it takes off the, the leaf surface um, in this pattern as it moves down. Um, you can imagine that uh, uh, adult moving down and scraping off that leaf surface. Um, it is uh, an overwintering uh, organism, temperature dependent. It's not really an issue for us when we talk about field corn, other than it does uh, transmit uh, uh, bacterial wilt, Stewart's bacterial wilt. And so we can see that if we have a hybrid that for some reason doesn't, doesn't have high resistance to 
uh, stewards bacteria will, we can see that uh, out in the field. I've experienced that once or, or twice in my career, uh, a field of uh, truly dent corn that had an issue of uh, bacterial wilt in it. Uh, typically where we see bacterial wilt more of a problem is in our sweet corn um, varieties where we have a little less uh, resistance built into those. Um, so uh, generally when we talk about dent corn, we're talking about resistance. Uh, where we're talking about some other um, other uh, types of crops, uh, other um, uh, sweet corn, uh, we're talking about maybe using an insecticide treatment. Uh, the damage itself uh, from the leaf scraping, because we're early in the season, as long as the corn plant is actively growing, really doesn't uh, really doesn't put the stand at uh, issue. Um, it would be if we're going through. Uh, you know, emergence and we're having a very slow growth period due to a cool climatic condition that it looks concerning out in the field. But uh, generally, we're not going to do anything from a uh, dent field corn standpoint as far as application is concerned or worrying about flea beetle. Um, we, we do often put in the corn newsletter a uh, article early in the season that talks about the overwintering, uh, where the temperatures are at. Um, where we may have um, the flea beetle um, development coinciding with the emergence of corn or just a, a small portion of uh, planted corn out in the field where we may have more of an issue. So uh, each year we do put that on based off of where soil temperatures and air temperatures are as far as the prediction of emergence. Uh, we have um, some early season insect problems with grubs. Um, there's a variety of grubs that we might have out there. Um, as you take a look at this organism, what's the life cycle on it on the, the left-hand side? Egg, larval, pupil, and adult. So we have a complete life cycle with this organism. And you can see here that uh, it's feeding early season, which is what we're talking about here is early season feeding on a crop. And then it, it can actually, um, go down a row and uh, really wipe out a portion of the stand if they're at uh, heavy populations early in the season, and particularly if we have some slow growth going on as well. Um, we also see it as far as the adult stage in corn, uh, we'll typically see it uh, feeding on um, silks, not tremendous problem in dent corn. In fact, I've never experienced where we would have an issue that we needed to treat. Uh, might be something that we're concerned about when we talk about sweet corn as a part of a, another complex of uh, other beetles that might be feeding at the same time on those silks and uh, causing mist kernels within that ear. So lowering the value or lowering the uh, appearance, aesthetic value of uh, that ear corn that we're selling at the market for uh, sweet corn. Uh, wireworm, uh, another um, insect that we have out there, the click beetle. Um, we worry about it in this larval stage and um, using a soil insecticide uh, in relationship to management of that. Um, here's white grub again. I got uh, out of order in just a little bit, but um, this one adds to it. Uh, some of the, you can actually identify, it could be with white grub, one of several different grubs from uh, beetles. And you can see here the identification actually is by the what the butt of the of the uh, larva looks like, and the hair pattern that's on that is actually how you can differentiate. Uh, the one that uh, has been uh, kind of a new organism that actually came into Northwest Ohio. One of the first things that uh, uh, Eric Rieker, as he came into Fulton County, uh, dealt with was uh, Asiatic garden beetle, which is also a white grub. The thing that you have here is not the uh, differentiation on the, the rear end, but actually this little nodule that is on the head of the organism differentiates that one. That's a smaller beetle, a little more aggressive than these uh, larger Japanese type of or related beetles. Uh, uh, Japanese uh, May June beetles or uh, Mask Schaefer are the three that you're seeing identified up here. Uh, they feed on the root system, reduce the amount of uh, roots, can actually clip off uh, the plants. Uh, so thinking about this from a management rotation, insecticide, and um, even um, I don't have here, but 
uh, thinking about it from uh, genetics and what uh, insect package is a part of the genetics of our hybrids. Hey, Greg, there was a question. How long does an insecticide seed treatment typically last regarding the control on insect pests? Uh, good question, and it's certainly not season-long control. We're talking about uh, two, three weeks is generally what you're thinking about as far as control in relationship to uh, these organisms. So, you know, if we would have a slow um, growing conditions, a, a season that uh, plants weren't actively growing, um, we might have a later infestation or later feeding that would cause this problem. But as long as we um, don't have that situation, um, certainly um, those uh, soil, or excuse me, the seed treatments can uh, be very effective control and would be a, a part of the package that we can include in uh, pest management uh, strategy for a field. Great question. Uh, slugs, uh, typically what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, residue being on the surface of the soil in a no-till situation, uh, particularly causing areas that are wetter areas within the field. The slugs develop and uh, like that environment, uh, they build up in population. They will actually feed on uh, the green material, of, as you see here, both corn and soybeans early in the season. Uh, best thing to do here is uh, scouting. Uh, Tillage can be an effective tool, getting those areas so that they aren't uh, as moist uh, for longer in the season and actually can do one of two things. We can start to reduce the population or we, we actually have the slugs move deeper into the soil profile because they move with uh, moisture. Um, we can plant, uh, adjust planting timing to uh, promote fast growth. Um, in essence, uh, slug growth can be outgrown by an actively growing crop and not be a, a problem. Um, we can use, uh, the, the, in this case, we're not talking about an insect, we're talking about a mollusk, and we can use a molluscicide. Um, anything with side on it at the end is a control for that type of organism. And basically what that is, is it's a bait. Um, it uh, can be used uh, um, as a, a bait out there. There's also been some use of uh, beer and traps and so forth. Uh, um, many people came to the conclusion it was better to drink the beer and uh, think about something else in relationship to trying to control the uh, slugs out in the field. But uh, there are a couple of bait products that have a spread pattern that can be spread in a field if we catch them early enough and uh, have an attractant that the slugs then come to and uh, get exposed to the insecticide. Greg, there's another question. Uh, do muscicides uh, need to be applied at night or early morning? Um, it's, I, I, I honestly haven't looked at the label, but this is one where you would want to consult the label on the product. The suspicion I would have would be having it out there at, you know, um, early in the morning um, as they're actively feeding at night would be the best thing to do because they're going to um, look for a place to hide um, as the sun comes out, dries out the surface, warms things up. It's going to look for a place to hide. It doesn't want to be in that direct sunlight. So yeah. um, probably should be some th things on the label in relationship to that application timing. And Greg, uh, the products, I've worked with a couple of them. It doesn't really matter when you apply. They'll, they'll last for several days. And so you apply them when it's convenient for you and it'll start working that night overnight and then be good for, you know, a week or so. These on the plant and you'll see that, you know, pattern feeding and you'll wonder what the heck's going on. Um, it will be when you come back um, at uh, the evening hours um, that you'll actually, um, you know, find these uh, once we start to see the, the sun go down or early in the morning. So a little bit of timing there may help you um, in identifying truly if that was is what it is or doing a little digging around the plants and, and uh, in that residue. There we go. Um, Cutworms, uh, um, there are, we talk about cutworms just like we talk about white grubs. There are a number of different cutworms that can be out there depending on en environment and, you know, what we're working with. Uh, 
as far as soil types and uh, cutworms uh, do exactly what is indicated. They cut off the plant uh, right at the soil surface, uh, basically um, scouting. Uh, certainly our transgenic um, hybrids are useful. Um, insecticides, uh, both soil and uh, seed treatments can be useful. And it really, in a lot of cases, what we end up doing is replanting the area. And that's going to be the most critical to think about, are they still active? Are they still um, something that we need to work ab think about? And you know, making sure that if it is, that we use an insecticide at that point to uh, fill in the stand. Because they tend to be uh, grouped in areas. It tends not to be a wide uh, field problem, but tends to be uh, specific areas in the field where we see cutworm injury, at least at a level that we're um, needing to do something with as far as management. Uh, corn earworms are certainly a problem and you see uh, them here. Uh, they can be multiples of different colors, uh, tend to feed at the tip of the uh, corn ear. Um, the management there is transgenic uh, hybrids and then insecticides, uh, foliar. Um, you can certainly see where this would be a problem in sweet corn uh, more so than uh, dent corn, even though we're going to see some loss of yield there. And, and in addition to that, certainly you're opening up this uh, husk to moisture and then uh, further um, ear rots um, as we uh, go through and progress in the season. Uh, stock bore is another um, early season, reduce weeds um, because they tend to uh, be um, in things like giant ragweed out in the field um, and can get into the um, you know, production crop that we have in the field. Yeah, although I'll, I'll admit with stock bore, I've never seen them be a problem in, uh, in field corn in my 30 plus years of experience. Uh, true army worm is one that we do need to keep track of. Um, this you can see here um, some descriptors as far as identification. Uh, they can be as you're out scouting multiple sizes at the point of scouting that you're doing. Uh, you'll see that heavy frass as you unroll the um, leaves on the plant. Um, it um, tends to be a problem where we have small grains either next to a wheat field that's uh, starting to uh, desiccate and, and uh, get towards harvest or and, and has had an infestation they will actually uh, as uh, says with army worm they will migrate out of the field across the road into a cornfield um, we can also see them be a problem where we have a rye or small grain cover crop and we plant into that and uh, we um, have economic thresholds defined here of 25% of the stand uh, with the potential for 50% defoliation of that stand. And I was in a couple fields last year. Uh, it was a cereal rye rapeseed cover crop and uh, we were approaching those levels and um, uh, fields where they had uh, um, a transgenic hybrid in it, but it didn't have the right package to control armyworm. They had other fields where the armyworm started, but they had the right transgenetic package in it and wasn't a problem. So, um, you know, when we talk about control there, being aware that we have um, armyworm in the area and then scouting and using foliar sprays, um, they're fairly easy to control, although we want to direct it towards the whorl of the corn plant. Uh, corn rootworm, uh, you see the beetles there, you see uh, the damage uh, here as far as uh, uh, reduction in, and they will feed on these nodes and take them all the way back to the um, base of the plant itself. And you can see that um, particularly in this plant. Um, what you'll see as far as symptomology out in the field is it's one of the things uh, where we have corn leaning over like this that uh, could be a corn rootworm problem. And these are actually the larva out in the field that would be feeding on this. Um, we'll talk about this in an example a little bit later, but uh, basically how we try and handle a corn rootworm is rotation. This is more of a problem in corn after corn. Um, we have transgenic hybrids out there that will do a very effective job on this particular insect. Uh, we see insecticides, uh, both soil, seed, and foliar that can be used in relationship uh, to 
controlling these. The foliar would be more uh, trying to manage um, adult populations, which we don't do much of, but uh, we might use it in the case down here where we're talking about uh, this being one of the insects in addition to Japanese beetle that will feed on silks. Uh, European corn borer, another one that had kind of disappeared in relationship to our widespread use of transgenic hybrids, but um, we've seen some resurgence of it out there. Um, typically um, in scouting, um, what you'll see is this kind of shot hole feeding on the plant. Um, it will move down into uh, the um, leaf vein and then down ultimately into the stalk. And what we see late season is this uh, here where we have uh, actually plants that are breaking off at this point where the injury is occurring. Uh, this is one of those where certainly knowing the life cycle is very important. We have a, a moth, adult, larva uh, stage, um, our egg, larval, st and uh, moth stage. And uh, so a distinct, complete life cycle here. And uh, what we see here um, with this is uh, uh, that we have to do any control that would be um, a spray application when it's working in the whorl of the plant. Uh, once it gets into the mid rib, rib of a leaf or it gets into a stalk, um, it's not going to be exposed to any foliar insecticides. So uh, life cycle is certainly important here. Um, this is another one of our ear feeding um, organisms. Western bean cutworm become more of a problem in certain areas. Um, although we haven't seen widespread impacts of this, uh, we do do some scouting and uh, trapping of this organism. The head capsule is pretty unique and is an identifier here with the three lines that you see. Um, it does act a little bit different in that you'll typically find these larvae, and I've seen them uh, numerous times uh, in this type of pattern where they're in the middle of the ear. They've actually went through the husk and start to feed in that uh, uh, burrow that you see there. Um, when we were looking earlier at uh, corn earworm, I didn't point out that corn earworm are um, in essence cap cannibalistic on each other. So there will only be one corn earworm on an ear of corn, but you very well may with uh, Western bean cutworm find multiple um, larvae working on that ear and you'll see multiple um, damage areas on an ear of corn from Western bean cutworm. Uh, scouting, insecticides, uh, and then transgenic are going to be important. Um, once again, knowing life cycle is important here because we have uh, this larval stage that is um, going to be susceptible once it's in and protected.